and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, the head honcho of Black F Spire Fantasy, I almost said Black Fire, and creators of the upcoming Swords and Chaos, which we'll be getting into tonight. Yes. The one and only Jeremy Farkas. How are you doing tonight, yes. man? Yes. I'm doing very well, thank you. That was a, a, an illustrious introduction, mm -hmm. and I'm very excited to be sitting down with you tonight. Oh, gracious monk. <laughs> oh. So, I'd like to open up with the humble beginnings, in a sense. Okay. Oh, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Yeah, sure. Um, so, when I first played a role-playing game, I guess I didn't really realize that I was playing role-playing games um i had a friend whose uh f dad had like copies of um like the first edition advanced dungeons and dragons uh manuals like laying around and he had gotten them the third or 3.5 D D stuff and he had thumbed through it and kind of understood it um and he was like explaining it to me and some of my friends and what we wound up playing was uh, this version of the game where he would describe things happening and we would uh, declare our actions but no dice were ever rolled and there was no character sheets and no numbers um, and I, d I don't know it was very very atypical um, it was almost more like playing pretend mm -hmm. um but it was, that was very instrumental to me. And eventually, uh, many years later, I went back to Dungeons & Dragons and played it proper. Um, I think it was uh, the fourth edition of the game uh, by that time. And I played that for a little while. And I I, uh, I didn't really get out of it what I was looking for. And then I went back to uh, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. And I ran that for a few years. Um, then played some fifth and got into the OSR through Appendix N and... Um, I found DCC RPG, Castles and Crusades, Swords and Wizardry, uh, mm -hmm. Old School Essentials, all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah. Um, Just remember, it's always Zach's fault. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Oh. No matter what it is, blame Zach. That's right. <laughs> Correct. Oh. But given given some given um. Given some of the, given that little dive into um, OSR, um, I'd like to play a little bit of a lightning round, and whether or not you had either played it, dipped into it, or ha or had some experiences with it. Sure. Um. So we. Um. This might. So, I'll say, I'll start with since you brought it up. I'll start with Dungeon Crawl Classics. Played it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Good. Uh, yeah, played it, ran it. I own a couple adventures. Uh, enjoy it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Um. Anything by scene nominee. Um, is mostly responsible for stars without number, scene more. Uh, um, Godbound, and and a bunch of others. Oh, Godbound. I know Godbound. I have a copy of Stars Without Numbers, and I was looking to pick up a copy of Worlds Without Number. Mm -hmm. uh, I have not played it. I've yeah. read them. Worlds Without Number is exactly what you think it would be. It's it is the yeah. fantasy sister to Stars Without Number. Stars, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Adventurer Conqueror King system. I want that game so bad. <laughs> I cannot tell you. <laughs> Yeah, I've co I've covered that game my fair sh my fair share of times on this yeah. on this channel, and I've talked with um, Archon a bunch of times. Oh yeah, um, that's cool. He's a cool he's a cool he's a cool guy. Mm -hmm. Um, swords and wizardry. Swords and wizardry. Yep, 
I love it. That's a great. Uh, it's probably my favorite. Um, O D and D retro clone. Uh, retro clone. Yeah, it's very much trying to be white box. And whenever, yeah. as an aside, whenever, whenever somebody says that they started out with with um, O D and D, I always I always have to ask them which version. Yeah, yeah. Because saying that you started out with with say first edition D and D doesn't tell me a whole lot. That doesn't that doesn't mean anything. It's like oh okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Okay, this one might be this one might be a weird entry, but um, flying swordsman. I've never even heard of flying swordsman. Flying swordsman. The best way for me to describe it is. So is someone taking old school D and D and putting a wuxia spin on it? Oh, that sounds cool. Mm-hmm. And it's actually free. What? Mm-hmm. That sounds awesome. Um. Okay, this might this this might be pushing it, but um, Golgotha. I've heard. I know that name. Why do I know that name? Golgotha is do, is doing oh, is doing old school, but it is leaning far more into hard SF. Okay. Um, Hyperborea. Yeah, yeah. I have uh, second edition. I backed the uh, third edition. Mm-hmm. Um, into the odd. Uh, I know I, I know the I know the game. That is the one where that's the Chris McDowell one. Yep. Okay. Uh, I'm familiar with it. I have not played it. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, Bastion Land. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah, um... yeah, yeah. <laughs> electric. Ba- I don't know why, but whenever I see art from Electric Bastion Land, all I can hear in the in the back of my mind is um one is an album from the Sword, and well, any album from them. That's the one that has the really awesome uh, blending of like really old like wood grain uh, public domain art with like Photoshop elements, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. The Black Hack. Oh yeah, of course. Everybody's and- played the Black Hack. I know some pe- I know some people say that the black hack doesn't doesn't count because it does does too many things different. Um, I don't think I don't think every I don't think ev- I don't think in order to be OSR you have to pretend it's 1974 all the time. No, no. Um, I mean, I mean technically the black hack is a spinoff of the white hack, so you know, uh, yeah. the white hack is a spinoff of. They're all forks of something. Yeah. Oh. Which is which is the reason why I don't try and do a um a tr- a tr- a um genealogy tree when it comes to the whole thing, but Oh yeah. It's um, like where do you put Troika in that tree? It's like oh <laughs> I like it should be in there somewhere, I guess. Yeah. I just need to figure out where it is and I need to be drunk enough to try it. To try yeah, to try yeah, and yeah. figure out where I'd put it. Um Labyrinth Lord. Uh yes, I have read Labyrinth Lord. Um I get the distinct impression um that it would run uh very similarly to most early iterations of Dungeons and Dragons. Mm-hmm. Oh. Which is a good thing. Mm-hmm. I don't mean for that to sound negative. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um a lot of people bring this bring this up. I have mixed thoughts on it, but Lamentations of the Flame Princess. Uh, yeah, I can imagine why. Uh, <laughs> uh, I own Lamentations, the 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 one book of which the second will probably never come out. Uh, it's a slick little game. I'll give it that. Uh, I like it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have some of the adventures for it, mm-hmm. but that's a that's a whole kettle of fish. Um, Osric. Um, I have not. I don't own any Osric products. 
uh, but I have a deep respect for uh, what they do. Mm-hmm. Uh, that whole advanced Dungeons and Dragons, keep, keeping that, you know, legacy pumping is pretty great. Mm-hmm. Um, since th- since this one made waves when it came out, um, Mork Borg. That made a ton of waves. My God, <laughs> that's. Like the the I was just just at Gary Con and there was like so many new Morkborg products out. I was like, whoa, man! I gotta check it out. I haven't played it yet. Yeah, um, I don't know if it won it or not, but I do recall hearing that Morkborg got nominated for a graphic design award in Sweden. A um, not a not a gaming graphic design award, a legit um graphic design award. Well, it should win like the Any at least. I think it did. I think it did win Any. Well, I can't imagine. What else would beat it? Um, probably something else from probably something else under the free league umbrella because free league yeah. is be, has become this monster of game development in in um, Sweden. Mm-hmm. Um, the fantasy trip. Not familiar with that one. And um. Last but not last but not least, um, Tunnels and Trolls. I own Tunnels and Trolls. I have a copy of it autographed by um, uh, our dear friend Ken, mm-hmm. uh, who's quite the character. I'm sure he is. Uh, if you ever get the chance to meet him, um, uh, I've actually played Monsters, Monsters, mm-hmm. uh, but not Tunnels and Trolls. So they're yeah. kind of basically the same game, but you can play the monsters and monsters, monsters. So I don't know. Yeah, and I've um, um <clears throat> I I um as a bit of a troll move, I once said that Hackmaster should count as OSR, even though Hackmaster is meant to be a joke. It's a parody. Yeah, it's a it's a joke, but it's a joke that ended up working a little too well for its own good. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's it was Hackmaster, right? Where you could get like an honor stat, and if you had too much honor, <laughs> people would yeah. like, like not like you anymore. Yeah. Then then again, um, sometimes sometimes works that are made that, that are meant to be parody end up actually working. Um, I remember when that when Lawful Dice made that Dungeons the Dragoning game and. Everyone thought it was an April Fool's joke until they actually read it. It was the dragoning. He basically decided, "What if I? What if I mixed? What if I mixed D and D? What if I mixed some um, D and D, Warhammer Forty K, and <laughs> Seventh C, Seventh C, World of Darkness, and Planescape, and throw them all in, into a blender?" Oh my god! And it works. Like not, is this no real? Ch- yes, it is real and it is completely free. It was ma- it was it was put it was it was made on a dare. Oh my god! And I remember when I first read it, I was like, "This should not work at all," and yet it does. <laughs> wow! And- well, I know what I'm reading. I, I know what I'm reading next. <laughs> I'm gonna bookmark this. Yeah, it's. I did a I did a review of it a while back, and I I was like, this should not work, but you could run a legit full on campaign with this. It's a campaign that's gonna be bonkers, but you can do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like um, uh, not Gamma World. What is it? Um, Spelljammer. No, the one that's even nuttier. The one that takes place on a post-apocalyptic Earth. Where you can be like mech guys and like psychics and... Rifts. uh, Thank you, Rifts. (sighs) Rifts has been my whipping boy for over 20 years. (laughs) It kind of deserves it. Oh. A lot of it is due to the fact that I... uh, I've told this story before, but I have a... I studied web usability at one point in time, and... A lot, and a good chunk of that was all about navigation. Yeah. So, 
Books that have bad navigation make my blood boil. <laughs> that, yeah, that'd be rifts then. Yeah, the the whole ins. A lot of that is on Simbeta because even in the mid two thousands, he was still insistent on using analog forms of editing when everybody had already gone digital. He was still using yeah. the same editing, still using the same analog st analog style printing press like editing that he was using back in the eighties. At least, at least according to, um, to one of the people who worked with him and put and put that massive expose on the RPG.net forums back in two thousand five. I remember that. Which, granted, it it was only one side of the story, but it was pretty damning. And then, what happened? What happened with the whole Robotech tactics thing? Oh my God, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Then shortly after yeah. that, Re Robotech tech, Robotech um, gets adapted into by two uh, by two other systems, and I ended up le and Rifts gets a Savage Worlds adaptation, which honestly is a natural fit, and I ended up laughing yeah, because sure. of all those years where Simbeta would get so happy if anybody tried to convert his game. Now it didn't. Yeah, people were doing that anyway. Yeah, that didn't stop people, and I was, st and even back then, I was still able to find people doing D twenty conversions of rifts. Not my first choice, personally, but okay. No, no. But as I understand it, you've di you've dipped into um pu into writing before before end, but this is your first full on full full sized um book si book system at all. Instead of a add-on to something that's already present. Um, yes I... and no. Um, so this is an adaptation of the Siege engine. Um, of uh, are you familiar with Castles and Crusades? Yeah, that w I yeah. I explicitly avoided Castles and Crusades when I did that lightning round because I figured it'd be redundant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so. Uh, I got, I got, uh, I reached out to the troll lords, mm -hmm. uh, who are great guys, and I was like, "Hey, um, I think that your system would be a natural fit for uh, a sword and sorcery role playing game because it's weighted toward very competent characters succeeding at things, um, and it assumes that even at first level." Most of the time, your character knows what they're doing. Um, they don't have um, an OGL, any kind of open game license, set up for um, their uh, Siege Engine skill system situation. So I just reached out to them privately and was like, hey, I would like to design uh, a spinoff game. And they were, they were all for it. So I started working on an extensive well i started at working on the game and i started adding in these little minor tweaks because there was one or two things that i was like well i would do this differently and i would do this differently um and then those kept compiling and compounding on top of each other and i was like wow i've made a lot of not a ton of changes but i've made quite a few changes to where i can't uh in good faith say yeah this is a one-to-one -one with Castles and Crusades. I have to say, well, it's a modified modified siege engine. Mm -hmm. So it's like there's a lot of um, Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition in there. Not a, not a ton, um, but uh, like the advantage disadvantage systems in there. Um, I brought in um, damage types, which mm -hmm. Castles and Crusades doesn't have. It's just straight damage in Castles and Crusades. Mm -hmm. And I I brought in. Um, uh, resistance and immunity, mm -hmm. which um, Castle Crusades has, but it's not structured. And you can, like, if it, if if like if a monster has resistance to something, you have to read the description to see how resistant it is. Whereas mm -hmm. in Dungeons and Dragons, if something has resistance, you know, oh, it takes half damage. Mm -hmm. It's some streamlining, and I streamlined some things with like. Um, 
capping. Um, your your armor class can only get so high, uh, and your bonus to hit can only get so high, so as to prevent um, uh, characters from getting so powerful that weak. Mo you never get to a level where you can just wade through an army of goblins and they just can't hit you. You know, mm -hmm. and because uh, I see that as a bug of like. Uh, like the 3.5 era of Dungeons and Dragons, which Castles and Crusades is built on. Mm -hmm. um, so some tweaks like that, but it's um, and there's some there's some there's a little bit of DNA from other games in there too. Like there's a little bit of Dungeon Crawl Classics in there. There's a little tiny bit of um, the Conan uh, 2D20, mm -hmm. just like a drop. Um, there's um, quite a bit of uh, uh, original, like, uh, OD&D white box, uh, especially in regard to Overland and uh, dungeon exploration. Mm -hmm. um, and I just kind of mixed this, <laughs> this big pot yeah. of all, all these different disparate ideas. Yeah. Um. If you'll forgive me for sounding a bit Minnesotan, it's um, it sounds like a TTRPG hot um hot dish. <laughs> no, you're yeah yeah it is it is, um and uh, people who play it will who are familiar with those games will recognize oh this is kind of like this and oh this is kind of like this, um, but everything's tweaked and twisted just a little bit so that it all plays nice together. Mm -hmm. Um, I went through quite a few rounds of testing to get it to where. I was satisfied with it because obviously I can't just like take an idea from one game and drop it in and expect it to run just fine. Um, uh, there's a lot of work involved in and that kind of ensuring... thinking doesn't work in engineering and it it's not going to work in game design. No, no, <laughs> definitely not. Um, and so, to be and, fair, and, and, oh, go ahead. To be fair, you are you are in good company when it comes to that kind of hackery because. Well, that's how Rollmaster got started. Uh, yeah. Because <laughs> originally it was just a collection of D of D and D um, house rules that got codified into Arms Law, and then as time went on, it became its own thing. Hmm. And, and then it gets simplified in Merp, though. I use heavy air quotes with the term with the words simplified yeah <laughs> and there there are a number of um there's quite a lot of original stuff in there too mm -hmm. um like um uh, one of the things i'm really proud of is the um uh the background generation system mm -hmm. um which kind of works similarly to um not what are they called in advanced dungeons and dragons not non-weapon proficiencies they're called um it was in the dungeon master's guide it was like a little table that you rolled on to determine what what you did as your occupation before you became an adventurer yeah i know i know what you're refer i know what you're referring yeah. to um i since you brought since you brought that kind of thing up i hope to god you didn't you didn't bring in the exceptional strength D100 roll. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. Uh, the best bonus you can hope to get from your strength is a plus three. Mm -hmm. um, and that's attributes range three to 18. Um, and uh, really what I... The, the, the core objective of the making of this game was I wanted to build a game where I could make Conan the Barbarian and Elric of Melon and Benet. Two very different characters. Mm -hmm. But I wanted a system that would allow me to make both of them and have them both be functional characters. Mm -hmm. And by God, we did it. It took a while, but we got there. Um, I'd say it'd have a better chance than the... Than the times that the times when TSR tried to put Conan into into a couple modules. Oh God. <laughs> yeah. Or their weird uh, Conan box game that wasn't like it's like a Conan box set, but it wasn't. 
It had its like own rules. That yeah, was that um, that used the uh, that used what's known as the action control table. It's not too far removed from the rule set that was used with Marvel Phase Rip and certain editions of Gamma World. Oh, plus that version. That particular game has gotten a second chance at life with Zephyrus, or Zeb's fantasy role-playing system. Really? Mm-hmm. Which is essentially the, essentially that same system, just with just with all the Conan stuff um, made Remote. legally distinct. Oh, yeah. File the serial numbers off. Mm-hmm. Paint it up real nice. Yeah, the same way that... D6 space is the Star is the Star Wars RPG, just with the Star Wars taken out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're space wizards, and this is your laser sword. Mm-hmm. And you're like, uh-huh. Gotcha. Yeah. Oh. But one thing that one thing that I found kind kind of interesting was some of the influences you mentioned on the Kickstarter page, because yeah. well, one of them was very obvious because everyone and their brother and their brother's baby's mama has brought it up, but. The other two are names that I don't hear as often. Um, Charles Saunders and Carl Wagner. And while I'm familiar with both, I do think giving a bit of a skinny as to their contributions to Sword and Sorcery and how, and, um, how that's going to be reflective in Swords and Chaos is something worth going into. Yeah. Um, I'm really glad you brought this up. Um, so... Um, well, when I was in college, I I picked up a copy of Imaro, mm-hmm. and I read that, and it completely blew my mind. Um, Imaro's, Imaro is a uh, sword and sorcery novel by Charles Saunders, um, and it features um, an Africa-like setting with... Um, uh, an all-black cast in a really authentically African-flavored stories steeped in um, the folklore and mythology of uh, uh, African anthropology. Because mm-hmm. Saunders was, an, was a, a cultural anthropologist, first and foremost. And I didn't realize how much I was missing out on by just consuming um, uh, fantasy in a European medieval setting. The I was like, whoa. A term that I, a term that I like to use when regarding that particular um, fa- that fantasy that fantasy um, trap is yeah. the Tolkien melting pot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good term for it. Oh. Um, and to be cl- to be clear, I don't have anything against to- I don't have anything against Tolkien. I absolutely love his I absolutely love his books. As do I. Um, I um I feel sorry I feel sorry for Stephen Long during the times that, he- given the stories that he's told me about wor- about working with the Tolkien estate. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, you cut out. What was that? Um, I feel sorry for Stephen Long given the stories he's told me about the time he worked with the um, Tolkien estate on. The decipher Lord of the Rings game. Mm. Uh, they were extremely anal about what you could and couldn't put in. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you can just go crazy. Well, you could put in stuff from Return of the King, but not the appendix, for instance. Right. I don't know why. I think it's like a rights thing. Like they hadn't sold the. Like I know that's the thing with the the movies. Like, um, uh, New Line had the rights. To everything from the books, but the appendices, because they were there was like a plan to like uh, novelize a lot of the stuff from the appendices or something. I get, I guess, but the what I've always what I've always resented, and this is a problem that I've had. I, some say some think that this is a new problem. It's not. I've had th- I've had this problem since I started. Of this idea that in order for something to be fantasy, it has to be so rooted in the trappings of Western Europe. Right. 
especially the especially the British Isles. And yes, I can't help but suspect that part of the reason the something like The Witcher got as popular as it did is because of the fact that it was very clearly a Eastern European flavor and especially a Polish flavor. Yes, I would agree. Oh, now, I don't have. I don't. Again, I don't have a problem with with the idea of doing Western fan of Western European fantasy. I just don't think it should be the be all end all for something to be considered fantasy. Because I remember, I remember going on discussion forums with pla- about Planescape and some people considering that to be too weird to be considered fantasy. Some wanting it to be labeled as science fiction mm-hmm. or uh, we- or weird fiction and uh, and. I didn't see it like that. Um, then again, then again, my fa- then again, my favorite campaign settings with AD and D were um, Alquadim, Dark Sun, and Spelljammer. So what the hell do I know? <laughs> right, right. Uh, but the now with Car- with Carl Wagner, he's mostly known for um, Kane. I think he's more known for his horror, but yeah. yeah um, just to, f- to finish the thought on uh, uh, Saunders, um, when I when I read um, his Amaro stories, I realized that there was a lot of um, uh, uh, different cultures that weren't at the the typically associate cultures not at the table that is typically associated with fantasy. Mm-hmm. So I went out of my way to. Um, dig really really deep into history and cultural anthropology um and build a world that's uh very diversely representative mm-hmm. of um different cultures and folklores and histories mm-hmm. um and so when you look at a map of um the world of swords and chaos um it vaguely resembles the 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 afro eurasia supercontinent um although one that's really kind of messed up due to um, changes in the tides and um, an impact from a meteorite. It's kind of a, implied that it's like an alternate timeline kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. But um, I really went out of my way to incorporate um, as much uh, as I could of other voices and other ideas. Mm-hmm. And the, the way you describe it, it kind of reminds me of the way um, Robert E. Howard was set was setting up his world, where it was a um, pro a prototype of a lot of a lot of the cultures that would that would be that would inherit that would inherit it. Yeah, yeah. There are, there are echoes mm-hmm. like there um like there are certain cultures that are um, if you really know like. If you if you know like your geography or your history or um, your mythology, um, certain names mm-hmm. will jump out at you, and you'll be like, "Oh, that's like this." Um, like the um, there's a there's a the, um, there's a nation called. Um, hold on, nuts. Oh, my mouse. A broke. nation called nuts. No, it's not called nuts. I promise. <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't help myself on that. Uh, there's a nation called Tartarus of the Steppe, mm. and it's located just around. Um, it, it's just east of a very large um, body of water, a very large inland sea mm-hmm. um, that vaguely corresponds with where. Um, the steppe people of Mongolia existed, mm-hmm. um, who in medieval times were called by Europeans, Europeans, Indians, and even uh, Eastern Asians, the Tartars. So it's like, oh, the, the Tartars of Tartarus live in this place called Tartarus. They're not called the Mongols, they're called the Tartars. Mm-hmm. Hence, and there's a bunch of there's a ton of stuff like that um like uh lemuria um 
the lemurs get their name from the mythical land of Lemuria. So Madagascar is where lemurs are from. So Madagascar becomes Lemuria. We spotlighted that onto India. So now this new subcontinent is this new fictional subcontinent. The whole thing's called Lemuria or um, what was the Iberian Peninsula, which is now fused onto Africa. We call that just Iber or Iberia and, and so forth and so on. And it goes on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And with the, now with that in mind, when it comes to the content of the matter, um, you had written seven. You had written that you're gonna, that this is going to have seven character classes. Um, Correct. Now, before before I get into the those classes themselves, are you? What are you doing the level cap at? Around ten, or are you going fifteen ish? Level cap uh, is ten right now. Mm -hmm. um, in the future, I don't know. Um, I'm speaking completely. Um, out of my own mind right now, uh, nothing's planned. Maybe we'll re at, at some point we might release a book for higher levels. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, but I can't imagine, um, a game that would support, uh, anything much higher than maybe 15th level. Um, because, uh, in 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 my experience running games and the style of games that Swords and Chaos supports, um, w once you become too powerful, um, the the horror element of the intimidation and fear of encountering these supernatural beings very much fades away. Um, so if you were to hit twentieth level and all of a sudden you're scoop slamming. Uh, genies and, and, and running down krakens and lighting mummies on fire like it's nothing. Uh, they're, they're, the imbalance is a, the balance is a little bit too much in your favor. Mm -hmm. um, so we've arrived at 10 and for now we're sticking with 10. Yeah. And I'm perfectly fine with 10 and besides 13th Lage does um, only 10 levels and manages to make that work. Yeah. <laughs> but I can I can I can presume that four would it be correct of me to to presume that four of the character classes are the basic four or do you have a different setup? Uh, you would be incorrect. Yeah, I've, I was fifty fifty on that. Yeah, um, three of them you would most likely recognize. I guess two. Um, there's a fighter mm -hmm. and there's a rogue. Um. There's not a magic user or a wizard, but there is a sorcerer who is basically a magic user, but it's a sword and sorcery game, so we call him a sorcerer. Mm -hmm. um, but, of course, magic using, uh, casting spells in the game is a, a dangerous thing that can, can backfire on you, so there's a lot of complications involved in that. So for a, for a basic class, it's... Uh, pretty serious. Um, and there is no cleric mm -hmm. because um, the gods of the world are beings that exist only in the the they exist in the faith and text of the religions of the world. Um, mm -hmm. People believe in them as a matter of faith, um, but there is no quantifiable evidence to verify one way or the other whether or not they exist. All right. There are powerful beings, um, like in a more, almost like a more cocky in sense. There's like uh, the Court of Chaos, mm -hmm. um, but very, very few people know about them. Um and some of them may masquerade as gods. Um, I don't want to get too into detail on that. I'll let people discover for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, uh, if if a player character is a religious character, um, that is a personal choice that they make. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and and healing is healing is uh, covered in in other ways. Yeah. So we you had mentioned the fighter, we've mentioned the sorcerer. Um yeah. is and the rogue. The, yeah. Uh, that's what I was going to ask Nesk if you, if the thief was going to be present and you've got that with the rogue. Yep. Um beyond that what what else what else would be there as far as classes? So we've got the assassin um who's a close relative of the rogue. Mm-hmm. Um but he forfeits the thieving abilities for the ability to um get a one shot kill on an enemy. Mm-hmm. He has to spend three rounds setting it up, but if he's successful at it, um he can kill an opponent in one in a single hit. Mm-hmm. Um we have the barbarian which is uh, almost like um, it's less modern Dungeons and Dragons barbarian. They don't like go into like a frothing rage as like an unthinking, violent homicidal maniac. Um, um, They're more like a, uh, like an intense um, survivalist, um, who can pump themselves up and and uh, perform uh, superhuman feats? Mm-hmm. Um, but if they turn toe and flee, um, uh, they inwardly, you know, they lose that they lose that momentum and they. They kind of, you know, deflate a little bit, and mm-hmm. they only get to, you know, only last as long as they stay in the fray. It's certainly a step up from the AD and D barbarian. Yes, <laughs> oh, that poor guy. You know the whole, the whole thing of I must destroy, ma- I, I must destroy magic items until I, until I'm, until I'm tenth level, and then I can finally equip magic items. Something the fighters <laughs> able to do in since day one. First level, yeah. Oh. It's like, what's your deal? Why, why, why do you decide you can use them now? Uh, I've decided I can. All right. The um, whole, the whole yep, yeah, the whole compelled to destroy magic items thing was. I thought it was dumb then. I still think it's as dumb as some of the paladin incidents. <laughs> it's just they needed a way to differentiate it from the ranger. Um, well, the Ranger's been snake bit since it came out. Yeah, yeah, it has. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see, we got we covered assassin, mm-hmm. barbarian, fighter. We got the knight, mm-hmm. um, which is a lot like the uh, the cavalier of. Um, is it going to be dependent on a horse? They get bonuses for being with the horse, but they are not nerfed for not having the horse. Oh, uh, uh, which is good because, well, the problem with the problem with the cavalier, it wasn't a bad, it wasn't a badly designed class, but in a game called Dungeons and Dragons, you're not taking that horse underground <laughs> with you. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's the that's the same reason the ranger snake bit. It's kind of hard for them to be to do what they do best when you're indoors. Well, that's that's why they gave him like the favorite enemy and stuff, um, which I think fa- I think um, I think with I think with the way favorite enemy has been designed th- over the years, um, people have been people have been working in reverse. How do you mean? Well, you have to pick. You have to you have to pick one. You have to pick one of a. Ver- of a variety of monster types, and you yeah. have an advantage against that against that specific type. Yeah. Um, the problem with doing that is that is that if the GM is not using that monster type at all, you're you're just a you're just a gimped version of a fighter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, if your if your GM's cool, you can go to them beforehand and be like, "I'm building a ranger." Can you tell me about your world? Mm-hmm. Like, what what can we expect to run into? On w- on um, one hand, I can see that. On the other hand, it fe- it feels like um, having the having the GM. F- yeah. Well, 
either min either min maxing or um it it's tw it's way too many um assumptions yeah and i'm generally not a fan just from a design standpoint of using using the a good G a good gm will figure this out as a get out of jail free card uh -huh. that's what that's why i say that the whole favorite anything enemy thing is working in reverse i think i think and actually one game that I've been following called Heavens and Heresies has done this. It's a better it's a better approach to to say okay, you can try you can try and spot it, you can try and um spot to determine the t to determine if it's this ty if it's this type of uh, of a, a certain type of monster and once you figure that out then you get your bonus instead of having to pick the monster type in advance. Just have a pool to draw so from. You can... So you can s assign your type for like the day or something. Um, more that there's a pool that you have ac that you have access to that would ch that would change a bit in how a bit in how you'd fight, but okay. only but only after you figured out the tar the target's type. Okay. Well, uh, this is interesting because our next class is the ranger. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I I wrestled with this this topic because. Um, like the original ranger was good at fighting giants. I don't know if people fought a lot of giants in original Dungeons and Dragons or what. Not unless they were uh, probably not unless they were running against the giants. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and so, um, there's no paladin in this game, mm -hmm. and so I was like, I can take a little bit of what the paladin has going on. And bring it over to the ranger, um, specifically because there's not a lot of typical monsters in this game. Like you're you're mostly fighting like humans and like wild animals. Um, occasionally, you're going to run into supernatural things or or servants of chaos. Mm -hmm. And so, what I decided to do was that rangers in this game. Are they're guarding um, civilization from the influences of chaos and sorcery, mm -hmm. um, and so they they get benefits against fighting things like demons, ghouls, monsters, um, uh, devils. Um, are you I, saying they have their own version of even if even if it doesn't have the supernatural component smiting? No, no, no! It's not like smiting. Um, they they get the ranger bonuses to to track and fight and attack mm -hmm. things, but it's anything that's considered a servant of chaos. So anything, basically anything weird, um, ranging from like a a cannibal to um, one of the lords of chaos itself, um, ghouls. Um... That I'm that I'm more fine with because of the, because of the fact that it's. Um more open to interpretation, yeah, as opposed to the as opposed to the favorite enemy list i I mentioned beforehand where it's a case of okay okay the where it's a very specific where it's a far more a very specific, specific type. yeah I can actually read the list off to you if you want uh, favorite enemy mm -hmm. uh, da, 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 da. And the magically uh, sorcerers, the magically corrupted minions of chaos, and the spawn of hell. This would include such creatures as demons, sorcerers, serpent men, flesh golems, ghouls, cannibals, ape men, necromancers, etc. Mm -hmm. So anything weird? Yeah. Now, when it comes to homelands, since this is a sword and sorcery game, and you're going with the imp the implication that you're mostly playing as humans. Um, yeah. How much of a factor does Homeland have in character creation? Is it mostly um, narrative, or does it have some um, stat modifiers? It doesn't. Your Homeland does not affect your stats at all. Mm -hmm. um, what it does do... Uh, oh, I wanted to... Oh, yeah, Rogue and then Sorcerer. So that was, that was all the classes. Mm -hmm. Um... 
So what your homeland gives you is it gives you a language. Typically, you get a choice of, between, of one between two languages. Um, and then the other thing it gives you is a feature. Uh, I tried to give every homeland two features. Some of them uh, don't have them. Um, just No, I think they all have them now. So you get your choice of two features. And features are these niche... Uh, they're not niche, but there's, they're these little abilities that you get that are largely contextual. Mm-hmm. So um, they reflect on um, either the environment or climate of your homeland or the culture in which you were reared. So um, if you came from a place that outsiders don't know a lot about, you might get the the bonus, the benefit Savage Fear, um, which is little, little is known uh, about where you come from, from outsiders. Um, so you... Uh, You are awarded advantage on attempts to intimidate others or to lie to them about facts regarding your homeland. Um, and it's just a little little widget that you get uh, regarding a very specific thing because of the place that you come from. Mm -hmm. uh, another one is opulent. So if you're from a really rich kingdom and you choose that, uh, if you choose opulent, it would imply that you're from the rich cast of whatever homeland you're from. Mm -hmm. um, and that just basically gives you double the starting uh, gold and it gives you advantage on wisdom checks to appraise the value of an item uh, seamanship uh, gives you the ability to navigate uh, in your home in your um, in familiar waters to you um, you also get the ability to swim which is mm -hmm. useful um, survivalist mounted archery. Uh, th there's one for surviving in extreme heat, one for surviving in extreme cold. Uh, there's there's one that gives you supernatural languages uh, if your culture is one that's really accepting of like magic. Mm -hmm. um, and that's basically it. Like yeah. um, I tried to, you know, I tried to approach it in a in a sensible way. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, since get, since this was this is something that some OSR games do and some don't, are you do do you have a unified um, XP threshold for classes, or do you have it that certain classes will level up at different thresholds? Uh, classes, different classes level up at different thresholds. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. Now, I'd like to go into a bit of the a bit of the core mechanic. Sure. So, as I, as I understand it, with um, with prime with primary attributes, it is D twenty plus attribute modifier plus level. Yep. And is it the case where no ma where no matter what the baseline difficulty for primary attribute is always 12? Uh the dungeon master or excuse me, the game master can modify it, but they will never uh, they will almost never tell you that it's modified. Um there there are environmental factors that can affect it. Um mm -hmm. and there's there are tables that that break it down for the game master to mm -hmm. show this is where you uh, you raise it by five, or you raise it by even ten, or one, two, or three, or you impose advantage or disadvantage. Um, because yeah, I know because um, if you had a plus three and you were level ten, technically it would be impossible to fail a primary. Um, yeah, I mean, and obviously there's gonna there's gonna be situational modifiers in it in any instance. But I was curious yeah. if um. If that twelve DC is meant to be the baseline, the way fifteen has been for the D twenty system for years, correct? Yeah, it is. Uh, um, but that's that's uh, locked to um, just your just your primary mm -hmm. attribute, and that's something that you choose um, at character creation, um, and 
there are two ways uh, that I've seen emerge during character creation for determining a uh, primary attribute. There are ultra specialized characters who take their highest stat and make that their primary so that if they're called to make a check, there's almost no way they're going to fail uh, with their primary mm-hmm. or with, with, with whatever that is. And then there are generalist characters who make their primary one of their worst stats so that they can cover up their weaknesses and make a more well-rounded character. Um, so there, there, there's some give and take there as far as the different types of characters that wind up coming out of it. Um, some characters, even at high level, um, if they're like, uh, more well-rounded, it's not a guarantee that they'll be able to succeed against that 12. But the assumption is generally that, um, a 12 is, um, right at that range where, they're competent enough that generally they should be able to beat it. Um, if it's just a baseline, Mm -hmm. um, but there's almost always a little something modifying it. Um, most often though, it's going to be disadvantaged. So they're rolling, uh, two D twenties and taking the lower of the two. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to, when I th- when when I saw the whole primary and secondary attribute, um, at first I had thought that it meant that there were certain derived attributes that would require a hi- require a higher amount. But the way you describe it, it sounds like the primary attribute isn't too far moved from the prime attribute in the in um in OSR. Uh, correct. The, like where you have like um. Like where where you, had, um, where, the, where you had to have a certain score in specific yeah, 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 attributes yeah. in order to qualify for a class. Um, uh, in a way, because um, certain classes, every class has one attribute that you have to make your primary. Mm-hmm. There's no like ability score requirement that you have to meet, um, but you still have to make one of you have stuff like technically you could be a sorcerer with three intelligence in this game which is abysmal uh but you still have to make intelligence your one of your primary attributes Mm -hmm. so you're rolling with a minus three penalty um to all of your intelligence checks but you only need to beat a 12 um so which i guess would come out to beating a 15 yeah isn't that hard that's 25 percent on a on a d20 baseline mm-hmm. um now one of the interesting things that i came across was the re- mechanic regarding burning a point of a point in attribute yes how did that come about uh burning a point for spell casting you mean uh or for luck just just the idea of burning a point of one of your attribute scores period um that was an idea that i had seen um we had encountered in oh where was that what was that i'm trying to think back now I just really liked the idea of sacrifices to fuel spells um, and in one of our games this is before the development of this um, I had a player who was like I don't want to I don't have anything to sacrifice and I was like oh just chop off a finger and they looked at me like I had worms crawling out of my ears and um, we tried to figure out how to adjudicate it. And Mm -hmm. we decided that he'd lose a point of dexterity. Um, And I gave him a big bonus on his, on his spell. Mm -hmm. And uh, we we decided that that was a really cool idea. And then um, 
later when we were playing Dungeon Crawl Classics, I was like, oh my god. It's... Look at this. Because they have a very similar mechanic in Dungeon Crawl Classics mm -hmm. for fueling uh, magic spells. Um, I forget what they call it. Um... Let me look it up. <laughs> Magic spells ACC. And... Temporarily burn points. Oh, well, I can't find it. Um, and I was like, that is so cool. So I decided, okay, so this can be done. It's been done before. Uh, and it's uh, been converted into a codified system. And when I was working on my game, I, I was going through a big, I had a big list of uh, house rules um, that I had used in the past. And I was kind of ticking them off going, yes, no, no, yes, yes, no, no. Um, and that was one where I was like, oh, I definitely got to, definitely got to put that one in. Mm-hmm. And with that, with that in mind, I'd like to sh I'd like to shift a bit into um, sorcery. Sure. Which this is always one of those things that I look very closely whenever I'm dealing with a sword and sorcery game because the one because you don't want to you don't want to have the the mage be your be um, the fix it button. No, you don't. Um. Also known as the Monty Cook method. <laughs> no, no, you don't. Oh. Not in certain sorcery, at least. It's no. perfectly fine in other in other genres. Even in other, even in other genres, I have I've always had I've always had an issue with um, certain spells that I feel dip into places that they that they shouldn't be. Yeah. Uh, whether it be whether it be stepping on the toes of other classes, looking at you, knock. <laughs> or me or messing with a DM's narrative control, looking at you wish. Yeah, that'll do it. But with the way that the way that I've always seen sword um sword and sorcery's relationship with magic is that it's a, it's a case of people messing around with problem with powers that they do not fully comprehend. And, yes, and it's a and I liken it. I've always likened it to someone um, opening up a shaken up soda can and hoping it doesn't explode. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a very apt uh, analogy, and it almost always does. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes more literally than others. I've yes, I've pl I've had to do perils of the warp rolls in my in my Warhammer games where my bright wizard decides that. Um, this is a good time to explode. Oh, and Warhammer had such a great like the warp. Mm -hmm. Like all all of that stuff. I loved Warhammer's approach to that kind of stuff. Like with the 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 color pools and mm -hmm. it, was, it was so evocative and, and, and indicative of the setting. Yeah. But there should always be that risk of e of either corruption or things going horribly wrong with um, sorcery. Yes, and I agree. As I understand it, you have a corruption system for for that. That there's a five percent chance that a spell misfires. Yep. Well, a baseline five percent. Mm -hmm. It gets bigger the more you cast spells. Um. So. Uh, every time you cast a spell, uh, there is uh, if if you if a spell if you if you have to roll a, a d twenty to like hit someone with your spell, mm -hmm. uh, if you roll a one, um, boom, you get a point of corruption. Mm -hmm. If you're not rolling a die, if it's like an area of effect or something, it's incumbent upon the dungeon master to roll the die for you, mm -hmm. um, just so that someone's always checking. Every time a spell is cast, someone has to check. Um, for every two points of corruption you obtain, the threat range increases by one. So if you have three points of corruption, uh, 
you now it's now a 10% chance uh, of gaining corruption. Mm-hmm. If you have five points, it's now a 15% chance and so on. Yeah. All the way up until it's a 25% chance. So if you roll a one, two, three, four, or five mm-hmm. on your on your D20. Um the the scale maxes out at 10 points of corruption, at which point uh the player is uh, I would I would recommend the player be removed from game, mm-hmm. um, because one of three things happens. Uh, if the player is a magic user, um, they are either driven irrevocably and horrifically insane. Mm-hmm. Or they are physically transformed uh, into one of the subhuman chaos spawn, which are uh, gibbering, mutated uh, terrors of sorcery. Shoggoths. Um, <laughs> Demi Shoggoths. <laughs> um, no two look alike. They're like insane mutants Mm -hmm. um who just whose whose mere existence radiates chaos so if he turns into one of these things uh all of a sudden he's going to be giving everyone corruption and that's really bad Mm -hmm. um if the character is not a magic user and gains 10 points of corruption which can happen through a number of different ways um mostly by just being near a really horrifically evil thing or mm-hmm. seeing something really disturbing or interacting with a powerful wicked magic item um they are either driven insane they might die i guess at the at the game master's discretion because technically they're being removed from play anyway uh or they're transformed into a mutant mm-hmm. uh and a mutant uh does not have the mental faculties of a chaos spawn they are shambling crude humanoids um who seek out powerful ser- powerful beings of chaos to uh, uh serve in in their armies and they have a a sixth sense for detecting chaos and they'll just they'll just leave to go to go find a, a suitable master mm-hmm. or else they'll just attack the party And I don't, now I'd imagine that reducing corruption is is rare, but is it is it possible? It is it is possible. There are a few ways to do it. Um, there is a supernatural way to do it, and there is a medicinal way to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, the medicinal way is by consuming the white lotus, um, which is both rare and expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, and I believe that removes one point of corruption mm-hmm. per. It might be. It's either one or one d three. I don't remember. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's like per day, and you have to keep consuming it. And there's a chance that you become addicted to it. It's very habit forming. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other way is by means of this of a spell called uh, corruption expulsion, which does not destroy the corruption or get rid of it. It simply pulls it out of the caster and into a very, very expensive, um, finely carven uh, bloodstone, uh, mm-hmm. roughly the size of a human fist. Mm-hmm. Um, and they got to get rid of that thing because it doesn't keep it in there forever. It bleeds It bleeds out like two points of corruption a day or something like that. And if they mm-hmm. carry that around with them, they're just going to reabsorb the corruption. So most sorcerers who are responsible will dig a very deep hole and bury the thing. Uh, those who are less responsible will weaponize them and use them as hand grenades to throw at their enemies. Which... Well, one, one of the rules of combat is if it's stupid, but it works, it's not stupid. Exactly, exactly. Of course, if it doesn't break, uh, your enemy might pick it up and throw it back at you. So you always got to be worried about that. 
So uh, there are lots I, of lots of give and take. I like to call that an occupational hazard. Exactly. And there are there are some spells that are so unspeakably evil or so wicked that casting them just automatically uh, confers upon the caster um, points of corruption. Some of them give multiple points of corruption. Like there are some spells that conjure demons uh, from the pits of hell, which can just award the caster like two or three points of corruption. I think there's one uh, that gives the caster four. Um, I think that's one where you just like command someone to die. I don't recall. No. I haven't done any. Even w even with that, are you still using the Va the Vancian model when it comes to spell charges? Uh, yes. Um, however, I've I've leaned into the Vance the Vancian style as hard as humanly possible because I think uh, that the reason people have an aversion to Vance. The, the Vance and the, the Jack Vance spell system is because it's often kind of pasted onto a world or onto a game without a lot of thought. Um, so I, I went back to the literature. I went back to Jack Vance. I, I, I read um, The Dying Earth, T Tales from the Dying Earth, and I read um, uh, Cudgel Saga. Mm-hmm. And I didn't read the the one after that, or Rinalto. I didn't read those other two. Mm -hmm. I'm about halfway through the second casual story right now, but um, I went I went back to those and I, I took extensive notes. And what I arrived at was that um, the hierarchy for spells is not nearly as codified as it is in Dungeons and Dragons. You don't have nine tiers of spells um, with all of this all of these complex uh, subtleties to them and the number of spells that a powerful wizard can contain in his mind is way less. So what I did is I crunched down the I think there's there's nine levels of spells right? that the spell takes up in the cast. brain um there's no level cap to any of these spells so if you find a spell that you have the memory for in your brain you can memorize it and cast it mm -hmm. so as a first level as a first level sorcerer technically you could cast what is a, roughly the equivalent to a fifth level spell but that would be your one spell for the day and you would be exhausted afterward mm -hmm. um and the the names are super um the names of the spells are extremely uh, thematic and a lot of their um, uh, mechanical benefits as well. And I, and I was, I was careful to not allow the, um, the really powerful spells to stack on top of each other. I didn't want um, uh, quadratic wizards. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants quadratic wizards except quadratic wizards. themselves. Ex exactly. Exactly. Oh, I know this because anytime someone even get someone even gets a hint of reducing um, the the amount of power that casters have, they cry foul. Uh, yep, yep. <laughs> but um, what did what um what at what at would the total amount of space that they have to memorize spells would that be determined by a certain attribute by the level of the caster or a little of both? Both. Uh, at first level, 
it's really, really, really dependent on their intelligence. Um, because at first level, a character is only awarded two uh, memory slots. But uh, they can be awarded up to an additional eight by their ability score. So that two becomes ten. Uh, at second level, they get three. At third level, five. Uh, then seven. Then 11, 16, 20, 27, 38, 50. Mm-hmm. At tenth level. So even even at like tenth level, a um, they get fifty. Let's say a sorcerer of tenth level with the the highest intelligence possible. So a tenth level sorcerer with eighteen intelligence. Has 58 memory. This is the the toughest, smartest guy that you're ever going to come across. Uh, he only has 58 points of memory. He could still only prepare two master level spell. That's the equivalent of a ninth level spell. Two ninth level spells. Um, or master. He can only c- prepare two master spells in a day, and then he would have eight eight points left over. To spend on, I guess, a minor spell, a basic spell, and an elementary spell, mm-hmm. and he would be real. He'd be tapped out, um, which is, I think, pretty similar to the literature, um, where, you know, um, uh, what's his name? The um, oh, I can't remember. Uh, the wizard in the the second the the. the in one of this, in one of the the stories in the first collection of short stories, there's a wizard who's talking about memorizing his spells, and he only has like, he's like, oh, I can fit like four of these ones, but if I go with a simpler one, I can fit five. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like, oh, it's pretty similar. Yeah, I, I think, I think, and the spells are in my opinion, they're they are useful enough that. They feel as though the caster is not being cheated, while simultaneously they are dangerous enough that they're not going to want to be abusing them all the time. So the likelihood that a caster is going to run out of spells very quickly is very, very low. Mm-hmm. That you know that a caster is going to blast through all of their their memory uh, for the day. And I'm guessing that I'm guessing that within the spell list, there aren't ones that end up doing the kind of things that other classes could do just without the dice roll. Like I said, that's the reason why I pick on knock as a, as a spell. Um, not that I can recall. I, that's a really good question, actually. Let me go through it. Mm-hmm. Um. And truth be truth be told, whenever I think of of um the of the whole memorizing spells, one of the things that comes to mind that isn't isn't technically Vancean but is more of a parody of it is Rincewind in the Discworld novels. Yeah, since his whole thing is that he can't he can't he's a wizard or as he refers to it a wizard, <laughs> um, who can't use magic because there's this one extremely dangerous apocalyptic spell in his head that's so dangerous no other spell wants to share headspace with it. Mm. And because of the fact that he has this spell, um, he's had he's had more than one attempt on his life to the point where there's the gag that everyone tries to kill Rincewind. Um, and that's his, great. His big, his big skill is being able to run away. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there, uh, it seems like there's one spell. Um, the trans- Transference of the Many Forms of the Oozing Lord um, uh, mimics the disguise ability of the assassin. Um, but it has a duration, whereas an assassin's disguise does not. Um uh, and what um what level of complexity is that? Uh elementary. Mm-hmm. Now when it 
comes to when it comes to um combat, um, as for, insofar as insofar as criticals, have you done the standard approach of increased damage, or have or has the idea of putting in a wound table um, been considered? Uh, um, the the book is so big as it is. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know that I should like it'd be cool. Um, but I'm gonna leave that up to uh, game masters at their tables mm-hmm. to to include. Because uh, for right now, the the official ruling is uh, double the damage. Mm-hmm. And I'm guessing that's double the damage straight on a natural 20. No confirmation roll. Correct. Which, truth be, truth be told, is how it should is how it should be. And I never saw the, I never saw the point in the confirmation roll my, myself. I, I, yeah, I don't know what the motivation behind that was other than to, like, I don't know. I, I, I can't get into the headspace where of the of the designers who chose to include that other than to make it make the probability of having something spectacular happen in a fight less than 1 in 20 but you're not designing the approach to the game design is not simulationist so i don't see what the point of it is there are if somebody wanted a more simulationist experience experience with their combat the question i would end up asking is why the why hell are you, are you playing, playing t- dragons yeah yeah why aren't you playing riddle of steel or something like that yeah yeah for real that's not to, that's not to disparage riddle of steel i love riddle of steel but oh yeah i think i think that i think that you're that you shouldn't tr- you shouldn't try and put a round peg into a square hole uh-huh um but what are you shooting for as far as far as the um, total page count? Right now, I have uh, two hundred and seventy-four pages of just text, um, with another six pages that need to be added. Um, in layout, I have roughly, if I go to my good friend. With whom I was speaking. Mm-hmm. Uh, who is doing my edits? He said that we were already at 300 pages before I dumped another 45 pages of raw text in his lap. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where it's going to land. I really don't. Mm hmm. Yeah, I could I could see it getting dangerously close to three hundred by the time it's done, especially once the uh, art starts coming in. Well, that's the thing; it's already at three hundred with with uh, the art. <laughs> um, I think it's probably going to be like three hundred and thirty would mm-hmm. be my guess. And what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Um, if I can get everything to the printer the second the Kickstarter's done, which I won't. Um, they said that they could have it shipped or they could have it um, packaged up and ready to go in early to mid-September. Mm-hmm. Which I was like, wow, that's pretty fast. Um, I'm guessing it's going to take me another three weeks at least after the Kickstarter is done to get everything I need finalized. Mm-hmm. Um, just because I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm, it's like hurting cats, all these, all these artists and different people. And it's like, Oh, I, for, I gotta fix this thing. And I gotta get this to the editors. And there was like 14 other things. I, I, I realized that I completely forgot to add um, uh, to the game. And I, I've been adding them uh, ever since Gary Con. Um, but it's just really swollen um, 
the book and kind of complicated things. And mm -hmm. so I got to send it. Uh, I got to send all of that back for revision. Um, it's it's shifted all the page layouts, so now everything's got to be redesigned. Not majorly redesigned, but re the layout's got to be adjusted to accommodate. Um, and uh, I miscounted the number of monsters that I had in the book. Um, so when I said on the Kickstarter that there were uh, over 200 monsters, I only mm -hmm. had uh, 180. So I frantically wrote uh, another 22 or so monsters, mm -hmm. which uh, took up a lot of my time. But they're in there now. Well, I will be looking forward to seeing how to seeing how the whole thing plays out plays out um, when the time when the time comes for release. And in lieu of jinxing you on the matter, yeah, thank you. Well, I'll tell you, um, I just just now got in the preview mm -hmm. of the first. 51 pages of Swords and Chaos, which I think I'm going to put up on Hold on, on a minute. Oh. the Kickstarter. Oh, hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Um, okay. Discord decided to be difficult for a second. Oh, okay. Sorry. What did you hear? Um, that you were going to put it up on the Kickstarter. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna put that up tonight. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like I said, I will be looking forward to seeing it. But cool. with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way up to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here no it's been great with and the guy swinging from that chandelier up there <laughs> and anytime you see feet fit to return the door is always open as i That's often fun. say around here drinking is not mandatory but it is encouraged okay very good and i can i can take this uh this stein here to go with me yeah yeah okay great thanks and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who, who took the time out of their schedule to list, to come into the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!